Hi, this is Chris Ferdinandi from GoMakeThings.com. Um, in this screencast, I'm going to walk through the first part of the first project in my Ditching jQuery Beginner's Guide to Vanilla JavaScript. Um, so what we're going to be doing for this project is we're building out a really simple show and hide, expand and collapse, accordion type widget that I'm calling Invisible Ink. Um, and you can see here I've got some um, just some dummy content that we want to show or hide whenever this click me link is clicked. And if I look um, look under the hood at the markup, it's just a really simple div with a class of hide me and an ID of hide me, and then a link that has a class of click me um, and an href that's just a, an anchor link or a hashtag pointing back to um, the content that we're trying to show or hide. I also already have an external JavaScript and external CSS file hooked up and attached to this, um, this document, but I'm not actively doing anything with those just yet. Um, so the first thing we're going to want to do, obviously, is hide the content here. And that's something that you can do with JavaScript. Um, in jQuery, you would do this using the hide method. Um, but all that really does is add a display none property inline on that content. And um, I find that that makes it harder to debug, harder to maintain. So I really like to have this stuff um, in an external style sheet. That also gives you the benefit of being able to do some more interesting stuff with it, which I'll show you later on. Um, but for now, um, let's just go ahead and add this hide me class to our style sheet and give it a display property of none. And if I reload the page, you can see that that content is gone. Now, obviously, when we click this link, we want to bring that content back. The way we're going to do that is we are going to just add a class back onto that, um, that element that is going to change the display property of it. Um, so um, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. I know some people are fans of really descriptive classes like is open, for example. Um, I personally prefer something more like active, which is what I use in all of my scripts. But this is very, um, very personal. There's no right answer here, so feel free to do whatever, whatever you think makes sense. Um, and I'm just going to set the display property back to block. Um, so what's really nice about this is that if you want to um, make an element visible by default rather than hidden by default, all you have to do is toss that active class on there. And then when you reload the page, um, or when you open up the page for the first time, you can see that that content is visible by default. Um, in our case, we, we want it hidden by default, so I'm going to remove that class. Um, so now the next piece of this, obviously, is when someone clicks this link, we need to toggle that class onto or off of the element. Um, and uh, the way we're going to do that is we're going to listen for clicks, which we do using the add event listener JavaScript method. Um, so first, we're going to grab the uh, kind of the, the link that toggles this action here. So I'm just going to set a variable to toggle. Now, if we were using jQuery, we would um, we would do this. Uh, but in native JavaScript or vanilla JavaScript, we're going to use query selector. Um, so we go document query selector, and this allows you to grab um, just like jQuery selector allows you to grab any valid CSS attribute um, that can be styled. Um, so in this case, click me. And I'm actually just going to show you how this works. So let's go ahead and console log the, uh, the toggle. So I'll open up the console, reload the page. And uh, now you can see it's just it's grabbing, grabbing that element. The, um, the way add event listener works is uh, so you, you take the element and you pass in, or you uh, you add this add event listener um, method to it. Tell it what event you want to listen for. So we're going to listen for a click, um, and then we want to run this function whenever it's clicked. Um, we want to make sure we pass in the event element here, and I'll, I'll show you why in just a minute. Um, but we uh, we also there's one more argument that needs to go in here. So at the very end, we want to throw in false. Um, there's this third argument to add event listener, um, use capture, um, which changes the way that um, event listening and propagation happens. Um, 
So generally speaking, you want to set this to false. I personally have never written a script where I've needed to set this to anything other than false. Um, so just for what we're trying to do here today and the scripts you're, you're going to write as you start off on your journey, I just pass this in as false and call it a day. So the first thing we want to do when this, um, this click happens is we want to prevent the default action from taking place. Um, so for example, when I click on the link, um, if I were to go look at my URL, you can see now that hash has been added to the URL because it's an anchor link. Um, that's fine on a page like this where there's no other content, but if you were on an actual page with real content, um, you're going to see a little jump on the screen when that happens, and um, it just provides a really awkward, janky user experience. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, and this is why we had to pass in event as an argument into this function, is we want to prevent default. Um, that prevents the default link behavior from happening. So you can see if I click this link now and I go up to the URL, that hash is not there. Um, so the, um, the next step of this is we want to find the element that this link um, is anchoring to and we want to toggle the class on that. Um, so very simply, uh, the way we want to do that is um, is uh, we're going to use toggle hash. Now you may think if if, uh, if you've played around with this a little that you may want to use href, um, but you don't. Let me show you why. So if I were to console log this, when I click on this, even though we are only passing in a hash for the href element, um, the browser is grabbing the full URL um, when it returns that. So um, this would not find an element that had an ID that matched this full URL, obviously. Um, so we instead want to just grab the hash. And you can see how that's a little bit different. That's just going to spit out the, uh, you know, the ID of the element we're trying to grab, which is great. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to grab the content, and we're again going to use query selector here. And we are going to pass in um, the toggle hash to get that content. And uh, you can see now if I were to console log this, I click it and it's giving me that content, which is currently not, not visible. Um, so there's a possibility that you might click on a link and the content you're looking for isn't on the page. You forget to add it, whatever. Um, that would normally throw a JavaScript error. Um, in, um, in jQuery, a lot of these errors tend to get kind of brushed under the rug, um, which makes it harder for you to find errors when they do happen, um, and also makes it more difficult for you to um, kind of learn the mistakes you're making and that sort of thing. So, um, so it's actually it's a good thing that vanilla JavaScript is a little less forgiving here because it's going to force you to become a much better coder. Um, but that said, um, what we want to do is make sure that the content exists before we move forward, because if not, it's going to throw an error when we try and call some of our additional stuff. Um, so what I'm going to I'm going to do here is I'm going to say if this content doesn't exist, we are going to just terminate this function and call it a day. Um, if the content does exist, though, we can move forward. So um, the last piece of this is we want to toggle that active class on or off of that element. Um, so if if the element is already active, we want to remove that class. If it's not, we want to add it. Um, and this is, uh, in jQuery, this is something you would do with um, uh, has class, remove class, add class, toggle class, that set of methods. Um, in vanilla JavaScript, we have something called class list, which works very much the same way. So I type the element out, um, go dot class list, and then I, um, I can either um, you know, I could add a class or remove a class, or in our case, we want to actually toggle the class. Um, so uh, I'm just going to toggle active class here and save. Let's go ahead and reload this page. And I am getting an error. Let's see, why is that? Toggle class list, toggle. Oh, because I'm toggling the class list on the element we clicked, not the element we grabbed. So that should say content. Um, that was a silly mistake. There we go. And now you can see as I click this element, uh, it becomes active or not. 
and shows or hides. Um, now that's great, but um, what if you wanted to have a couple of these on the page? Um, you know, so in this case, we can keep the class the same, but let's go ahead and change the ID and the anchor link. And you can see if I click on that, here's our, our content. And now if I click on this, nothing happens. Um, so the reason why nothing's happening is because um, unlike jQuery, where when you, um, when you do something like this, you're actually creating an array of elements. Um, so you're grabbing a, uh, you know, a set of elements that match this class. Um, with Query Selector, you're simply grabbing the first element that matches that selector. Um, so what we, um, what we really need to do is we need to make sure this event happens on all of them. Um, so the way you grab all events in, um, in vanilla JavaScript is with Query Selector All. And you can see now if I were to console log that, I'm now getting uh, a node list with both of those click elements in here. Now this brings us to a second problem, which is that add event listener um, requires a single element um, get attached to it. So we can't, um, you know, we can't run this against our node list. Um, now there's a couple of different ways you might be tempted to handle this. Um, the first is you may want to have multiple um, you know multiple selectors here um, where you're doing something like you're targeting it specifically by ID and then you're running you know multiple event listeners one for each one this gets really redundant um, and there's just there's so many better ways to do it so this is not this is not the best way to approach this um, it's going to result in a lot of extra code and a lot of extra work for you um, so you don't want to do that um, Another thing you could be tempted to do um, is to uh, to get all of the elements and then run some sort of um, loop where you're going to loop through every um, you know every element on this list. So let's go you know, toggle length uh, plus plus, and then attach an event listener to. Uh, to every one of these. So you're going to get a couple of issues here. Um, you shouldn't run event listeners within a loop. Um, <clears throat> it's just generally frowned upon. It's also really bad for performance. You don't want to have a ton of event listeners attached to a ton of different objects on your page. Um, it can slow down browser performance. So what we instead want to do um, is we're going to take advantage of something called event propagation. So let me show you how this works. Um, instead of listening for a click on the actual link, we're going to listen for all clicks that happen within the document. Um, and to do that, let's, um, let's also console log the event so we can see what's happening. So I'm going to reload the page. And now you can see that every time I click, doesn't matter if it's on a link or just somewhere randomly on the page, an event is happening. Um, the way we can use this to our advantage, though, is um, there's a whole bunch of properties that get passed back with, um, with the event. And the one we really care about is target. So you can see here, this is telling us that the clicked event was this click me link. Um, whereas if I look at the one before it where I just clicked the body, you can see target now is the HTML element. Um, so. We can use this to our advantage to listen for any click that happens on one of those expand and collapse links. So in our case, let's go ahead and uncomment this stuff again. Um, we are actually going to check to see if the clicked event is the one we want. Um, so I'm going to grab the event target. And then we're going to use class list again. This time we're going to use contains, which is similar to jQuery's has class, to see if it has the click me class on it. Um, if it does, we can go ahead and continue with our stuff as normal. If not, we're going to want to bail. Um, so I'm going to double negative this. So I'm going to say if the event target doesn't have a class of click me on it, we want to just terminate our function. Um, Otherwise, we can just move forward. So let's um, 
make sure a click me link was clicked. Let's go ahead and start adding some documentation here. Um, so we're going to prevent default. Um, then uh, this gets just a little bit different. So whereas before we were grabbing that toggle element and grabbing the hash off of that, um, we actually want to grab the hash off of the event target since that's now our clicked element. Um, so we just changed that toggle to event target. Um, and then we are going to um, uh, show or hide the content. Uh, let's go ahead and click save and reload the page. And now you can see that all of my content is working exactly as expected. And I could add a whole bunch of these and it's going to continue to work the same way. So if I, you know, I add a third one here and, uh, you know, maybe a fourth one just for fun because, I don't know, maybe you're building an FAQ page and you have a, a whole bunch of expand and collapse items on here. Um, you can see they all just kind of work which is exactly how, um, how you'd want this to happen. Um, now, uh, you can see just how little code it actually takes to make something like this work too. Um, so this is, this is 14 lines of code. It comes in at 372 bytes. It's really, really tiny. If I were to look at the jQuery version of this, um, you can see it's only, what, two, three lines of code shorter. Um, and in terms of size, it's like, I don't know, just a little little bit a little bit more than a hundred bytes smaller, but you also have an extra 82 kilobytes of JavaScript library to download before you can even use it. So you have to wait for all that to happen. Um, whereas this is just ready to use immediately. Um, so yeah, so that's um that's kind of the basics of getting an expand and collapse widget set up in JavaScript with vanilla JavaScript. Um, in, uh, in the next few phases of this project, we're gonna do things like shore up the accessibility um, to make it uh, a bit more accessible than it is today. And that is not something unique to vanilla JavaScript. I would recommend this sort of thing for a jQuery plugin too. Um, it's just most, most kind of really quick and dirty jQuery scripts tend to lack some of this stuff too. Um, we're also gonna get into kind of making this more of a proper accordion rather than just a one-off expand and collapse widget. Um, uh, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, the kind of thing where if I were to click this link, all the other ones that are open would collapse. Um, so, you know, only one is open, like a true accordion. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna, um, we're gonna do things like um, add some icons or um, maybe the ability to change this text depending on whether the, the content is expanded or hidden. Um, so, you know, imagine that this says, um, you know, this says show more, and then when you click it, it changes to say hide more. Um, so that kind of thing. Um, but that's it for part one of uh, the Invisible Ink project with Ditching jQuery, a beginner's guide to vanilla JavaScript. Um, hope this was helpful.